Hey friends, we're back again with another interesting session on light. Previously, we saw what light exactly is and how it affects our lives. But before ending the session, we posted two questions regarding the behavior of light. One of our viewers responded with the correct answers. They are reflection and refraction respectively. We will learn about these behaviors in a bit. But before that, we need to understand a few basic concepts which will help us a great deal as we move ahead. Let's begin. Say it's a hot summer day during which we decide to take a cool dip in the pool. The moment we enter the water, we feel different in this whole new world of refreshment. In other words, we feel a change. This change is also felt when we get out of the pool. So what causes this change? It is the change in our immediate surrounding or environment also called a medium. So, while we're in the pool, the medium we're in is water. And as soon as we get out of the pool, it's replaced with another medium, air. Friends, just like how there's a change brought about in us when we're in and out of the pool, light may also undergo certain changes when exposed to different media. So, let's say light passes through any random medium, like air for instance. For ease of explanation, we'll imagine hereafter the light to be represented in the form of a ray, like this. As light always travels in a straight line, the ray represents the straight path of light. The arrowhead represents the direction in which light travels. A collection of many rays is called a beam. So now, when light encounters any other type of medium, like glass for instance, then depending upon the type of glass, it undergoes a few changes in its otherwise straight behavior. Leaving all other types of behaviors to be dealt with in our upcoming sessions, for now, we'll only concern ourselves with the bouncing back behavior of light, the behavior called reflection. So, when light passing through any medium bounces off any surface or object back into the same medium, the behavior is called reflection. The surface at which reflection takes place is called a reflecting surface. Don't we usually associate the term reflection when we use mirrors for personal grooming and more so often to admire ourselves? We usually see reflection on smooth and lustrous metal surfaces too. But what if we told you that objects other than these two are reflecting surfaces in a way? The images we see before us are not smooth or shiny, then how are they reflective surfaces? How is the phenomenon of reflection the same, but its quality different? To understand that, let's quickly learn reflection in detail by taking the example of mirrors, which carry out reflection in the best possible way. Among them, the most common type of mirror is the one that lies in our bathrooms, bedrooms, halls, etc. It's called a plain mirror because it has a flat shape. Mirrors are made up of materials like glass or acrylic, with a thin layer of silver or mercury coated onto the back. This coating behind the material is in fact the surface on which we actually see our own reflection. This process includes light following certain rules. Let's get to know about them. Suppose there's a ray incident at some point on the mirror. As it is incoming or incident onto the mirror, this ray is called the incident ray. The point or spot at which the incident ray strikes the mirror is called the point of incidence. It is at this point too that the incident ray bounces off the mirror surface and is now called the reflected ray. It is this ray that meets our eyes and which we interpret as an image. But that's not all. Let's now imagine a perpendicular line to be formed at the point of incidence, called the normal. The angle that the incident ray forms with the normal is called the angle of incidence and that formed by the reflected ray with the normal is called the angle of reflection. It is to be noted that the normal has to be drawn for the angles to form. There are just two rules to reflection which we must keep in mind. The first is that the incident ray, the reflected ray and the normal at the point of incidence lie in the same plane. This means that it's not possible for the incident ray to be in one plane and the reflected ray to be in another because it would lead to error in the formation of angles when the normal is drawn. The second rule is that the angle of incidence is always under any circumstances equal to the angle of reflection. So let's understand this by selecting a few random angles of incidence. 
if a beam of light comes in at an angle of 60 degrees, light will get reflected at an angle of 60 degrees. If light makes a zero degree angle with the normal, that is it travels along the normal or parallel to it, the light will be reflected too in the same angle, thus giving rise to a parallel beam of light when there is more than one beam. These rules or properties of light are always true and also are universally accepted. Hence, they are called the laws of reflection. So, the next time you see a plain mirror and your own reflection in it, remember it is because of light that simply follows these laws. But wait, we must have all seen other types of mirrors too, which are not necessarily flat or plain, right? For example, the mirrors in the headlight of the car which help the light to be focused better, allowing the driver to navigate with ease. These type of mirrors are also used by dentists to focus light onto those dark and tricky areas of our mouth. The mirror we are referring to is called a concave mirror. This mirror is nothing but a plane mirror with an inward curve. Unlike plane mirrors, when light rays are incident onto concave mirrors, they tend to converge at a point and for this reason are also called converging mirrors. So naturally, the beam of light this mirror produces is called a convergent beam. This property of the mirror causes light to be focused or concentrated at a point, thereby amplifying its intensity, which gives it magnifying and focusing capabilities. Exactly opposite to concave mirrors in terms of both name and function is another type of mirror. It is used as rear view or side view car mirrors, parking or corner mirrors and street lamps to spread light across wider areas. These are convex mirrors. A convex mirror is a plane mirror with an outward curve. Convex mirrors are called diverging mirrors because when a beam of light falls on it, the rays do not come together as the shape of the mirror causes them to spread across wider angles. Now, if these various points of reflection of each light ray are extended to a single point behind the mirror, then it looks like these rays of light are diverging from a point, giving rise to divergent beams. Hence the name. This divergent ability of the mirror gives the viewer a wider angle or sort of panoramic view of the surrounding. These two types of mirrors come under the category of spherical mirrors. They are called spherical because they are curved and form a part of a spherical reflecting surface. But whether it's plane or spherical mirrors, can you notice anything in particular about the rays of light after reflection? Like for instance, the discipline or order they follow? Well, in the case of plane mirrors or metal plates, the light remains parallel even after reflection. And even if it's not parallel, it still follows a sort of orderly fashion of reflection called specular reflection. Please note, whether flat or curved, for specular reflection to occur, the surface must be smooth and flawless without any unevenness or irregularities. Let's understand this using the example of water. When the surface of the water is still, it is somewhat smooth and the type of reflection that occurs is specular reflection. So why is it that when the water is disturbed, we do not get the same quality of reflection? To understand that, let's consider the same parallel beam of light as before and imagine it to be falling on a rough surface this time, like the disturbed water surface. As the surface of the water is now uneven and distorted, the light rays no longer remain parallel after reflection and are in fact spread across in different directions. One can say that there is no discipline or that there is total chaos of reflected rays in such a case. This type of reflection is called diffused reflection. So in a nutshell, when we look at something glossy and shiny, specular reflection is the reason why we see our image or reflection on that object, while in the case of dull objects, diffuse reflection is the reason why we only see the object without our reflection. So that was making the long story of reflection short. Now let's stop it off by summing up what we learned. We broadly understood what reflection is and what reflecting surfaces are. We learned the laws of reflection and understood the basics of how it occurs in both plane and spherical mirrors. We looked into the two types of reflection, specular and diffused. Shown here is the image of this random object formed in a plane mirror.
In our upcoming sessions, we will see how reflection contributes to image formation in plane mirrors. That's all for now. Friends, in life as far as we are concerned, a mirror just cannot be trusted because it shows us what we look like, not who we are. Who we are is how we see ourselves. Until next time, keep watching, keep learning and subscribe to Let's Tune.